Hello, everybody. My guest today is Steve Vamos. He is, leads the global growth and performance of Zero. With more than 30 years' experience in global technology and digital media, he's worked in leading international businesses, including Apple, IBM, and Microsoft. Steve, you ready to take us to the top? Yes, I am. Great to see you. All right. So, Zero, kind of unique Australian B2B SaaS story in the SMB space. For people that have maybe not heard of you, which I imagine are few and far between, tell us what you guys do and, and are you a pure play SaaS company? Yeah, look, first of all, I have to clarify, we were born in New Zealand. We are New Zealand headquarters. It um, matters a lot to uh, our New Zealand um, stakeholders to always remember that. Yep. Uh, and it really started in 2006 with our founder, Rod Drury. And Rod had a vision for taking what was really the desktop cloud or desktop accounting application and moving it to the cloud. So Zero really uh, grabbed hold of that, listed very young in its life, and has grown since with investment by some major US technology investors as well as a lot of private individuals. Um, we now have scaled to become a global business with uh, operations around the world. Uh, we focus very much on the segment of small business where typically they employ maybe one to 100 people. <laughs> um, and ultimately what we've done, we innovated in the cloud. So for ex I'll, I'll give you a couple of statistics. In Australia and New Zealand, 40% of small businesses have been penetrated with cloud accounting. We are the major player mm -hmm. in Australia, whereas the rest of the world, that penetration is around 20 or less. So this is a, a case where uh, a local New Zealand Australian innovation has really led the adoption of new technology by business. So we're very, very proud of that and now very excited to be taking our innovations to the UK, the USA and many other markets around the world. And run rate, I wanna start now and then work backwards. So run rate today is about what? Well, look, probably the best way to look at that, we've got 1.6 million subscribers around okay. the world. Paying, um, paying small businesses. That's right. Annualized uh, monthly revenue. So if you annualize a monthly revenue out 12 months, which is AMRR is the language we use in SAS, we're about 600 million New Zealand dollars, which is around 450 million US dollars. Um, and um, we're sort of on the verge of, um, we've, our guidance is that we are trading very close to cash flow break even. Okay. Fair enough. Very good. So just to summarize that 1.6 million SMB customers around the globe, around the country, around the world, you're doing about 450 million bucks in terms of uh, US dollar run rate today. That would mean you're doing about $37.5 million per month. And each customer is paying on average in terms of ARPU about 23 bucks a month, something like that. Yeah, it, I think that's, yeah, that's pretty good. Spot on. Good, okay. Good. Yeah. So, so I want to get more into your head here. When did you join the company? What year? So I joined the company nine months ago. Uh, I took over from the founder, Rod Drury. And prior to that, though, I did have about um, over a year of working with Rod and the team. So I guess when I stepped into the role, Rod knew me well, and um, he was very keen for me to do this. And essentially, you know, Rod's a, a, a visionary, a great founder who essentially looked at uh, all the things I was helping him with were about scaling and creating a global tech company, much along the lines of Apple and Microsoft and other companies I've been exposed to. And it's really a lot of common sense stuff, but it's, it is management discipline that you're talking about. And Rod said to me, look, I see what we need to do to grow the business to where it can be. You should do it rather than me because I'm more interested in doing the cool stuff around innovation and new, new technology. And so I stepped in nine months ago and I've been leading the business and continuing the journey that started with me as an advisor with Rod. Interesting. So, so um, that's helpful to understand. When did you join the company in any capacity? Uh, it would be almost exactly two years ago. Okay, about two years ago. Here's, here's where I would love to focus on on this. Um, at this price point, 23 bucks a month, you typically, and I can cite constant contact, we can cite tons of examples where at this ARPU, churn is almost always an issue. And it's usually because, well, these companies are going out of business. They're SMBs. You've managed to drive pretty significant growth year over year based off your public filings uh, in the SMB space. It's not like you're aggressively moving enterprise from what I can tell, correct me if I'm wrong, but how, what is your churn today and how have you managed to keep it so low? Yeah, well, look, you know, we do, we do talk about churn and our, we're very, very fortunate to have a, a low churn rate. And I think there's some reasons for that on a, on a kind of monthly basis. Our churn rate is, um, actually, I'm just trying to think, what is it we actually, um, Look, it's around a 1% okay. um, churn per month. So that gives you an idea on an annualized basis. I think there's some really important things to understand about our business model. We really focus on that segment of small business where they're engaged with accountants and bookkeepers. Okay. Because that has two things, two effects. One is you engage the customer 
They're supported by their account and bookkeeper. And that was a, a difference that Zero brought to this space was the collaboration between the accountant and bookkeeper and the small business person where they see the same data every day. They can have a conversation about what's looking good, what's not. So that sticky, that creates a real stickiness in the customer's engagement with Zero, but also through the account and the bookkeeper. Mm-hmm. So I think that's an important thing to recognize. And my understanding would be that we would have the lowest churn rates out there in our space. Yeah, you, you, I've interviewed a lot in this space. I would, I would agree with that. This is the, one of the lowest I've seen. Now, just to try and pull a nugget out of here for my audience, are you selling almost exclusively through kind of what HubSpot does? It's almost all through resellers and the reseller is the bookkeeper? We, we look at it, we sell a lot through our partnership with accounts and bookkeepers. We don't call them resellers or think of them as resellers. So the way we typically engage with account and bookkeepers is say, look, we want to help you transform your practice in your business to be more efficient and also to be able to, for you to free up time to advise small business rather than crunch the numbers on small business. Mm-hmm. So we have a conversation with accounts and bookkeepers and we have tools to help them be more efficient. And in that conversation, we say the core of that is for you to bring your clients onto the Zero platform. So they work with us to do that. We support them in doing that. At the same time, we do go direct. So we will direct. Hold on real, real quick, Steve there. No kickbacks to them when they do that? Um, that what, the, the way it typically works is they get a margin or a discount. It's more a discount on the price. And then what they will do in most cases is on charge the subscription fee for zero to their customer. So let me ask you a question because a lot of companies have this issue when they have white label partners like this. If you give, I'm going to say that I'm going to call it Nathan's bookkeeping. If I have a relationship with you and you're giving me a 20% discount, let's say it's 15 bucks a month for me instead of 20 for everybody else. If I create marketing channels, spend money on Google AdWords, et cetera, I can essentially, un- and go direct to the consumer, the SMB, I can essentially undercut you on all your other channels because I have a cheaper price point than what you have listed if they work direct with you. So, so how do you make sure that that conflict never exists? Look, it, it's, um, I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I might not have followed you as well as you'd like, but, um, so I can ref- you, I mean, ref- I can rephrase it if you want. Well, well, let me just say, so we go, we would sell direct to small businesses and typically the small, we have a price for that and it's on our website. It depends on what package you buy. We also offer the same, um, many of the same thing, all the same things through our partners the partners then retain or get a lower price by virtue of the discount for them signing up to be a zero partner mm-hmm. and also working with us to a plan to adopt, bring as many of their customers onto the platform as possible. In terms of, so I think where you're heading to is, does price competition or channel conflict cause us a lot of problems in our business? The answer is no. Okay. The, the reason why I think it doesn't is it's still really early days in the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, adoption rates are low for cloud accounting and cloud, let's call it cloud small business. <laughs> so, you know, we don't really see, you know, we don't, we have competitors who price a lot cheaper than we do. And I think what's kept us strong is the fact that we were first in market in many, many places around the world. We do go through the accounts and bookkeepers and we talk and we, we build that partnership. So it's not about price, it's about the value that a customer is going to get out of this new way of doing things. So at this stage, we don't see lots of channel conflict, but our priority, if you said to me, what's more important to you, Steve, I'd say those account and bookkeepers working with them and going to their small business clients. That's our, our focus. Yep. Just to be clear, the 1.6 million customer account you gave me earlier, that, that's not the bookkeeper. That's the actual end. That's how many small business are working w- with you. Yeah. It's subscriptions to okay. small business. That would be, you know, um, small business, records or okay. you know, record keeping. So, so I want to get in your head a little bit about testing new channels. You know, Constant Contact really hit a brick wall after they were very aggressive with kind of radio ads and things like that. The stock markets in the US did not reward them when you looked at their PE ratio relative to other SaaS companies. Uh, I'd like to understand how you think about testing new channels in a programmatic way and doubling down when you see positive signs. Before we do that though, tell me where you're at today. So to get a new customer paying you 23 bucks a month, what's your fully weighted CAC look like? Um, so look, here's, here's the way we, we talk about, we publish um, our LTV, lifetime value of a customer to CAC ratios. Okay. okay. So basically what we do is we say, we calculate, once you sign up as a subscriber, we work out what the value of that subscription is to our business. And clearly 
that's a function of the gross profit that we make on on that subscription. So the is, gross are you in the eighty or eighty five range? Yeah, we're, we've and we've seen nice trends on on that uh, that metric. Where sort of in the last uh, six months, we showed a kick up of another percent to about eighty. I think we're eighty three percent. Okay, um, eighty three percent in the last half. So. Um, so that's really important just so that continuous efficiency. So that's a driver. Churn is a big driver yep. as well. Um, right now, Zero's overall blended global LTV to CAC is in the range of six or seven times, right? So for every dollar we spend, we get back six or seven bucks, which, um, and obviously in Australia, New Zealand, and more developed markets, we've got a higher LTV to CAC. Um, in new markets, it's lower. So here's my question for you. Um, it, isn't it dangerous to, in a purest way, look at LTV to CAC, especially in this situation? I'll tell you why. Your churn is so low, right? So if you have 1% logo churn per month and you do one divided by 0.01, that would give you a lifetime value of 100 months or over eight years at 23 bucks a month, right? You then multiply times your gross margin of 83% and you're looking at a gross margin LTV of like $1,900. If yep. you divide that by six to back into a CAC, the CAC would yep. come out to what is that, like 300 bucks? but that would still take you about a year and a half or almost two years to recover that on 23 bucks a month. So do you have, do you have the ability to be patient on how long the payback period is because you have health, you, you know what the cohort is going to do over eight years? Yeah, I, I think we do. And that's because um, as we've grown, so we're now at the point where, as I mentioned before, we hit another major milestone for zero, which is cash flow break even. Now that's congrats. Like a, that's fun. Yeah, it's, a, it's a huge milestone. It's, it hasn't happened yet, but it's, it's, um, our outlook, you know, our outlook statements, which are taken very seriously by the market. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's where we're heading. So um, that's really exciting for us because it says now that we've proven <laughs> we have a business and it can fund itself. Um, what we see is that because of the blend of developed and, and growing, and we've got the markets where we've really achieved penetration and efficiency and the markets where we're still investing. Our challenge is to balance those things so that overall our financial metrics are good. I think what you're suggesting is there's a, it, it, the, the big question we always face is how much more should we be investing given those very attractive returns and how far should we be investing to do that? So I think that's the big business question we have to answer for ourselves and we constantly look at that. I, I, I would put it this way. The guidance we're giving or the outlook we're giving says excess cash the company generates going forward as we scale will be reinvested in the business because, you know, at that sort of return rate, you, you, you just have to. Yeah. Are you right now in any acquisition talk or take private talks with a company like a Vista Equity or any other big private equity firms? Um, look, we, we, so the answer is no. We, the way we're looking at um, acquisition is more us acquiring other businesses. <laughs> we recently raised 300 US million dollars through the issue of capital notes um, and uh, convertible notes, I should say, convertible notes. And what we're doing is really looking at opportunities, not just to build and partner, but also to acquire new businesses um, that come into the portfolio and really meet our strategic needs and priorities. An example of that was, I'm not sure you're aware, we acquired HubDoc, a Canadian company. Um, great Canadian business. Um, it's a number of years old, a zero partner who um, help in the automation of the process of bringing documents and data into zero to streamline the processes accounts and bookkeepers use um, to obviously update the accounts and do what they do. So you're talking about Yosef, right? Yeah. Um, well, actually, I, I don't know. I think it was Yosef who you interviewed. A couple yeah, of years. yeah, yeah, yeah. They came on. They came on the show about about a year and a half ago with offices in Toronto and Australia, and they were doing like 1.6 million bucks in AR across 1,100 customers at that point. Yeah, well, the two Jamies who are the founder, the joint CEOs and founders, are now part of the Zero team, and we're really excited about having them on board. Did that pro forma worked out? I imagine you said, "Okay, we've got HubDoc. If we cross sell it across 1.6 million users, X percent are going to take it up." I mean, did that pro forma pan out? Yeah, it's all about that. It's it's about three things. One is driving the growth and adoption of cloud accounting, which means showing accounts and bookkeepers uh, the way to driving you know, their practices um, more into the cloud and bringing their small businesses online. It also is one that helps us in the expansion of zero from you know, doing accounting in the cloud to really what we are, which is doing business in the cloud. So the connections that HubDoc facilitates with suppliers, banks, and others, and then the streamlining of the import of that data and that content into zero for processing 
is something that's really attractive to us as a platform company. And then finally, we acquired great talent um, in the, the Jamies and their team. So about 20, they were about 20 people, I think, right? right? Uh, a lot more than that now. Okay, or they sorry, they were. Yeah, back when they came on the show, they were about twenty. Um, yeah, they're about, I'll tell you, they're about a hundred people now. When you bought them, what were they at? Um, look, not much less. So we only oh, okay. bought them. Recently. It was just a few months ago. Oh, okay, very good. So, have you? Um, do you have a good outlook yet on what percent of your one point six million customers you think are going to upsell into the HubDoc product as well? Uh, not really. Nothing sort of specific I talk about today, but certainly. You know, we've had, our, our approach has been very much to let the, the Jamies and HubDoc do what they do and do it well. Um, but we're also working closely with them to look at exactly that question as we go forward in our plans for next year and beyond. We've made assumptions and our assumptions are, I think, hopefully conservative, but we, we can see a real opportunity to um, attach that quite broadly. Yeah. And just to be clear, that was a fairly healthy acquisition. I think it was reported $70 million in cash and equity, right? Something like that? Yes. Yeah. Um, interesting. The, if you, if you in an executive team meeting next week kind of forced your executive team to say, okay, guys, let's assume we don't add one new customer and our strategy moving forward is expanding wallet share across the 1.6. In other words, how do we go from $23 ARPU to $30 to 35? Is it really going out and acquiring additional kind of hub and spokes like hub doc things that SMBs need to run their business in the cloud? It's about, it's about three things. And it is a conversation we have, not so much that we, you know, we've got two dimensions. We see so much upside in subscriber growth. It's, sure. it's got to be got to be focused on that. But also, you want to go deeper, not just because for financial reasons, but fundamentally because once businesses are in the cloud, we want them to do more in the cloud. So we look at new products. So we launched our, our projects and expenses products last year. We look at partnering. So we've um, got payroll solutions that we built. We partnered in the US with Gusto to provide a better payroll solution for our US customers. And then we look at acquisition. So the way we will look at acquisition is to say, in the life of a small business, once you're doing your invoicing, your, your, your purchasing, and your accounting in the cloud, what are the other things that you really want to do? Now, we're fortunate and we have 700 companies building applications on our platform using it, leveraging our APIs. Including 50, HubDoc. That's how you found HubDoc, right? Exactly. 50,000 developers. So we always already have a really wide range of application solutions on the Xero platform. But we will look at acquisition into certain areas where we think that that integration with Xero um, at a much deeper level makes a lot of sense. So um, we are very clear. Now, the other thing is uh, that I think is important, it's not just applications, it's actually services. So two of the areas we've been doing a lot of um, what I call uh, proof of concept that we see real business opportunity in are areas such as payments and lending. So, so Steve, let me ask you a question. Can I make a prediction here? Because you see, you see Intuit just did this with Smartsheets. You see Salesforce do this all the time. They use their app exchanges as a way to test partnerships. And then usually your BD teams are spending your time seeing if you can buy up the highest performing app. So you just told me that receipts, expenses, this might be interesting for you guys. Receipt Bank ranks very highly in your app store right now. Can I make a prediction you're going to acquire them in the next two months? <laughs> Look, I think you are absolutely right in saying that um, our app ecosystem is a great way for us to see what customers um, are valuing and the applications that they're using. I think what we have to do, and, and look, you mentioned a bunch of great companies there, we have to be smart and mature about our desire to have this platform, which is really, really fundamentally important, important and that conflict that happens when you start to acquire into that ecosystem. 100%. Yeah. Um, you know, um, you know the, the acquisition of HubDoc, you're right, there's overlap there with Receipt Bank. You know, we've, we're really clear and have had good conversations with all the parties about what we're trying to do. And we, I want Receipt Bank to continue to, to flourish. I also want to make sure Zero as a technology platform also has the best of what's possible in the way that we ingest uh, documents and data. So you've got to, it's, it's one of those things, <clears throat> pardon me, where you you have to accept that from time to time you you cooperate and sometimes you know you compete. So um, we're all going to be growing up about that. Yep. Last question here. You guys went public fairly early. This was before your time, I think, and I, I believe it was two thousand and seven. I think a fifteen million dollar IPO on the New Zealand exchange, right? That's right. <laughs> 
the 300 million in convertible notes you just raised, I don't, I'm not actually familiar. How does that actually work after you've gone public? Even, even before that, you know, you, I think you guys raised hundred million from Excel and 10.8 from matrix capital in 2015. How do you raise capital from traditional VC after you're already public? Uh, well, in terms of, um, well, it's a little bit tricky to answer that because we're not, not currently looking to raise capital from traditional VC. No, but you did. I'm, I'm saying, how did you, how did you do that? Yeah, look, that's before my time. I think Rod would um, probably have a good answer to that one. But I, I would think that knowing Rod and the way that the, the board of the company, that, um, you know, because the IPO happened really, really early. I mean, super early. You know, the shilling share price was a dollar. Yeah. And, um, and so I think Rod uh, being, he's a very inspirational guy. I think he would have sold the, the vision uh, internationally to all those key tech players and did it very, very well. So, you know, ultimately it comes down to the, the founder and the board um, having the credibility and the vision that uh, these, um, you know, really shrewd, smart um, and experienced investors can relate to. And many of them did and I think they've been rewarded. Yeah, no, I'm just curious actually tactically how they do that into a company already listed on the New wow. Zealand stock exchange. I just don't know actually functionally how they would how they do that. Yeah, well, typically what happens, you you list and you issue additional shares, but that still leaves you with a significant you know shareholding in the hands of um, other investors. So they sold the what they kept. Maybe they only sold ten percent. They then sold extra little chunks to these traditional U.S. based VCs over time. You would have had investors private transactions between shareholders who were in early who would have made their shares available for sale. And I'm not sure whether we issued more equity along the way, but I'm pretty sure we would have, actually, we did. So, um, because what I need to do to answer your question really well would be to have a look at what happened to the actual, you know, capital base, how many shares were issued versus back then. But I to work out how much of it was through shareholders transacting versus the issue of new capital or new shares. So, I I don't have that sort of at the top of mind. That's okay. we just had the Cvent folks on there doing about 600 million bucks in ARR. You guys are 450. Who, who's, which kind of B2B SaaS company that's not named Salesforce you think hits a billion dollars in ARR first? Can you guys do it solely focused on SMBs at a $23 price point? Well, I would I'd certainly hope so. I, I, I can't see why not. I mean, you look at market penetration, it's still incredibly low. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you put your penetration at right now? What percentage? Well, I think for the industry, it's a you know, around 40% in Australia and New Zealand and less than 20 everywhere else in the world. Okay. I mean, Canada's under 10. Yeah. Canada's under 10%. And, you know, it is Canada and Australia are very similar markets in many respects. Um, you know, US a little bit more more penetrated because you have Intuit there as their home base. So it really just, um, it, you know, there's tremendous opportunity in terms of subscriber ads and also a tremendous opportunity getting businesses to do more business on the cloud platform. Mm-hmm. Last question here. Uh, team size today, how many people? We have about two and a half thousand people around the world. Oh, got it. Okay. Drive yeah. honored. Very good. All right, let's wrap up, Steve, with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? I'm absolutely um, obsessive about the importance of the way teams think and they're led. So I'd say The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Lencioni is a must read for everybody. And then all the other books I love are kind of related to that. Good Boss, Bad Boss by Bob Sutton. That's a beauty. Yeah. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? I just read Satya Nadella's book. And as an old Microsofty, I really, uh, I'm really pleased to see how, you know. You're talking about refreshed? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Hit hit refresh. Sensational um, thoughts there from Satya. So I'd say um, that's the most recent and relevant one for me. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building your company? It has to be doing what we're doing here. I mean, I'm on Hangouts <laughs> or Zoom all day long. So I live, I live online um, talking to people through, uh, through these tools. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? I try and get eight, but it's been seven of late. I found that in this role, as soon as I do slightly wake up, I'm awake. So, um, <laughs> And Steve, what's your situation? Married, single, kids? I've got a beautiful partner. I've got two grown-up daughters and I've got six grandkids. Holy mackerel. And how old are you? 61. 61. 61 years young. I love that. Last question. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Yeah, that's a hard one. Look, there's so many lessons. Um, I wish I knew then how, how little I knew. 
<laughs> How little you knew, guys. There you have it from Steve again. Really got active in zero, call it maybe two years ago. Took over a CEO role, call it, you know, nine months ago. Now focused on obviously growth, 2,500 people all around the world. Good penetration in New Zealand, call it 40%, but maybe only 20% in the States and even 10% in Canada. They've broken 450 million bucks in terms of run rate across 1.6 million customers, SMBs mainly paying 20, 23 bucks a month. 1% logo churn per month. LTVs, you know, north of call it 1,900. That's gross margin. L to V. So healthy, healthy lifespan. They're spending up to call it, you know, six uh, or, or one sixth of LTV on CAC as they look to go into new channels and continue to drive growth, not only through new sub ads, but also acquisitions like the 60 million, well, 70 million total uh, deal with HubDoc recently, really funding a lot of that out of the $300 million convertible note they just raised. Steve, thanks for taking us to the top. Thank you, Nathan.